Okay, let's let's get started in, in the interest of everyone's time and, and uh, this webinar will be recorded so folks can go ahead and, and take a look afterwards. Um, thank you all for, for being on today uh, to talk about this important issue of the youth e-cigarette epidemic. Um, it's something that we at the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids um, have been really concerned about for years and, and have only seen, you know, disturbing trends uh, continuing among youth e-cigarette use. Uh, I know it's something that you all deal with every day as well in, in your role as principals in schools, and, and we want to uh, give you some, you know, background about the work that we at Tobacco Free Kids are doing, um, as well as some of our other partners. Um, so what can be done and, and how can we address the youth e-cigarette epidemic through policy solutions, but as well, so what are some solutions that you can use every day um, to help your youth in your schools, uh, as well as, as some things that are being done by, by a principal um, in Wisconsin as well. Uh, so today we have, um, I'll be speaking about some uh, of our initiatives at Tobacco Free Kids and a little bit about the youth e-cigarette problem, um, as well as kind of the solutions that we are trying to take to address it. Um, Megan Jacobs from the Truth Initiative uh, is going to speak a little bit about the This Is Quitting program that Truth Initiative has, and that's a text-to-quit program um, that they have specifically for um, teens to use uh, and help them quit vaping and e-cigarette use. And then Greg from Arrowhead Union High School in, in Wisconsin will talk a little bit about the issues that he's seen at his school um, as a principal and some of the ways that he's gone about addressing it. Uh, so so a, good, uh, a good webinar for you all. Um, hope it's helpful. Please uh, ask questions at the end and, and throughout folks' presentation, use the chat box. Um, you can unmute yourself using star six if you want to um, chime in, as well as you can use the, the raise hands um, feature on the webinar. Uh, and so that with that, we'll get started. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about some of the uh, work that Tobacco Free Kids is doing and, and some of the incredible um, and alarming statistics that have recently, recently been released about youth e-cigarette use, as well as what we believe is, is driving this problem. Um, so we have been making, you know, considerable uh, progress with um, with youth tobacco use. We we had had incredible declines um, across the board, uh, getting it below 10%, um, and as well as just increasing declines. But that all of that work is is at risk with the youth e-cigarette epidemic. Um, what we saw in early September, new numbers were released that show youth e-cigarette use among high school students has climbed to 27.5%. Uh, that's up by, from 20.8% 20, 20 in 2017. So we saw a huge surge, a 78% surge between 2017 and 2018, um, and then as well as just those numbers increasing to now one in four kids using e-cigarettes. Um, five million kids across the country are using e-cigarettes. Uh, they haven't released the new middle school numbers yet, but we fear that those numbers as well will be concerning. Um, we saw a 48% increase among middle school students between 2017 and 2018. Um, so these are all things that, that you know, we need to address, um, and it's a problem that's, that's not going away. Uh, it's a public health crisis. Um, it's an epidemic. You know, the, the FDA and the HHS, as well as the Surgeon General, have all called it rightly as such um, and are all trying to do the work to, to address it um, as well as, as we are with our public health partners. Um, and what we at Tobacco Free Kids, as, as well as the whole public health community, believes is at the root of the UC cigarette epidemic and use, uh, tobacco use at, all, in, at large is flavored tobacco products. Um, the flavors are what is really attracting kids to use these products, um, and then the nicotine is keeping them hooked. So the flavors pull them in, and the nicotine gets them hooked. Um, and then, you know, they think, they often think, and, and I'm sure many of you can, can attest to this, uh, they don't think it's harmful. Um, there is harm to the developing brain up to age 26 through nicotine. Nicotine is not good for any youth to use, um, and they should stay away from it. Um, you know, the addiction especially is incredibly large, and, you know, the huge fear is do they use e-cigarettes and then move to a combustible tobacco product, a cigarette or a cigar? Um, 
these are likely, um, you know, kids who would have never picked up a tobacco product, um, and we don't want them going down the road of, of a lifetime of nicotine addiction because of these products. Um, so as I said, the flavored tobacco products are what is really driving youth use and is what's making it popular among kids. 81% um, of youth who have ever used a tobacco product um, started with a flavored product, and 72% of current youth tobacco users used a flavored product in, in the past month. And that is all flavored tobacco products. So that is flavored e-cigarettes, flavored cigars, and menthol cigarettes. Um, but obviously e-cigarettes are, are kind of the, the epidemic that is happening right now. And there's over 15,000 e-cigarette flavors and counting. Um, you know, I'm sure many of you have seen many of these different flavors in your schools. Uh, Mango Jewel, S'more, Cotton Candy, Pop-Tart, um, these are, obviously marketed towards kids, um, not to adult users who want to use these products to quit. Um, so the, which the FDA has also not authorized any product to market itself as. So, so what we are saying is this is, these products are specifically trying to hook kids with their marketing and with the flavors that they're using. Um, you know, flavored e-cigarettes are popular among youth. 97% of current youth e-cigarette users have used a flavored e-cigarette in the past month. 70% of UC cigarette users say they use them because they come in flavors I like. And one really important issue is, is, the, is the use of mint and menthol. Um, so those are flavors that, you know, many in the tobacco industry would say are not flavors. You know, adult users need mint and menthol to quit using cigarettes. Um, that is just not true. Mint and menthol are flavors, and they are flavors that are addicting kids. Um, so we saw in these new numbers that were released in earlier this, um, in early September, uh, a huge increase in the use of mint and menthol among youth. Uh, so in 2018, we saw 51% of youth uh, using mint and menthol products. Uh, in the last winter, Juul removed all its flavored e-cigarettes, except for mint and menthol, from stores. Uh, and all we saw was kids flew, drove to mint and menthol in droves. Um, and as you see in 2019, we saw a huge surge in the use of mint and menthol. Um, it is now just, just shy of the most popular flavor among youth, um, just after fruit. And, and that is a need that any type of prohibition of these products must include mint and menthol, because that is kind of a loophole that the tobacco industry um, is trying to, to carve out for themselves. Um, so it's really important to remember that, that when we talk about uh, removing flavored products from the market, we're talking about all flavors. Um, so, so the product that you all are, are likely the most familiar with and what really is the market disruptor, the, the product that started the youth e-cigarette epidemic is Juul. Um, so Juul is, is sleek, easy to conceal. Kids are using it in bathrooms. Kids are using it in class looks like a flash drive, so, so it's really not on principals and teachers. It's, it's not fair to put another thing on you all to try to um, regulate in your, your classrooms. You all have a, enough to deal with. Uh, but, you know, Juul is highly addictive. One little Juul pod has the same amount of nicotine as an entire pack of cigarettes, um, and kids are, are running through these flavors uh, as quickly as possible. Um, one thing to note is, is last week, uh, Juul did say they were going to suspend the sale of all their flavors except mint and menthol, but as I just discussed, um, it's incredibly important to remove mint and menthol flavors from the market as well. Um, and Juul really was the, the reason for that huge surge in youth use between 2017 and 2018. Um, it's what, what got kids hooked. Um, you know, it lured kids in with the flavors. It got them hooked with the nicotine. Um, you know, it, it made it cool on social media. Juul was the first uh, tobacco industry to use social media to specifically target teens and young adults to use their products. Um, they had an entire uh, social media marketing campaign that was specifically targeted to, to look cool and something like kids would want to use. Um, you know, they also were bought a 35% stake share um, by Altria, one of the biggest tobacco industries in, in the United States. Um, and recently, uh, an Altria executive took over as, as, at their head office. So they really are the tobacco industry. Um, in July, there was a congressional hearing on Juul where, where several things came out um, among the, the practices of, of this company and how they targeted kids. So, so kind of three quick things really quick is um, Juul went into schools. They paid schools to be able to market their products 
um, as as kind of something that they said, you know, your kids shouldn't be using these products, but they're much safer than a cigarette. These products are specifically for adults. Kids shouldn't be using them. Um, and as, as you guys know better than anyone, um, when you tell a youth something that they shouldn't be doing and it's only for adults, it, it only makes it more attractive to them. Um, and so Juul masks themselves as the tobacco and uh, as, a, as folks trying to help kids quit um, and then really gave a lot of mixed messages in these meetings um, with youth, uh, with no adults present, no teachers present. It was just the Juul, uh, Juul representative and, and kids talking about these products. Um, so as well, Juul marketed to kids outside of school. So they, they funded a summer camp for children as young as third grade um, for people who had been uh, caught with e-cigarettes uh, on school. But what really happened here is is Juul was then able to get all of the information and surveys that these kids took during this summer camp time. Um, and as something the tobacco industry used to do, they took this information um, and then used it towards the marketing strategy of what the kids liked and didn't like about these products. Um, and it was able, they were able to then hone their message um, to really target exactly who they wanted to, which is our kids. Um, and the third thing that came out of that hearing was that Juul had a huge uh, social media department. Um, they had a, a department specifically that was called the influencer department, and that was specifically to recruit um, social media influencers, people on Instagram and Twitter with over 30,000 followers, uh, to use the product and make it look cool. Um, and then it was kind of from then on, then, then kids see those products, see it, it's not direct advertising, uh, but it's enough to make it uh, attract kids. And, and while they suspended all their social media advertising since this point, um, it's, it's they open Pandora's box. Um, and there's nothing that, you know, we can do about it now because kids do their advertising for them. Um, so, so Juul is a huge part of, of the market. They're now 68% of the market. Um, but what they've also done is, is they've spurned lots of copycats. Lots of folks that saw Juul get rich off the, the backs of our kids and said, I want a piece of that. So now we see things like Stig and Soren, which are, are very similar to the same sleek and cool technology-like, um, easy to hide type products. Uh, and then it's just uncontrollable. Um, with how they're targeting our kids and, and we can't, you know, put the genie back in the bottle. It's, it's done. Um, so this is also not the first time that the tobacco industry has targeted kids with flavored products. Uh, high school boys smoke cigars at approximately the same rate as cigarettes and African American um, high school students smoke cigars at nearly three times the rate of cigarettes. Uh, cigars are, are the most used tobacco product by African American youth. And then, the only flavored cigarette still on the market is, is menthol cigarettes. And over half of youth smokers and seven in 10 African-American youth smokers smoke menthols. And that's because it's easier to smoke menthols. It cools the throat and, and, and tames the harshness of the tobacco smoke. So, so it's easier to use uh, and it's more of a starter product for a kid. They can, they can ease themselves into using this tobacco product. Um, so, so what can we do about it? And this is really where Tobacco Free Kids works the most is, is what can, how can we address this epidemic and reverse it? Um, so FDA has the authority to regulate tobacco products. Um, they could pull flavored products from the market tomorrow. Congress could prohibit the use of flavors in tobacco products. And states and localities could pass legislation to prohibit the use of flavors, um, which, which they've been stepping up and doing. Um, you might have seen that, that in the early September, uh, President Trump did say that they were going to clear the market of flavored e-cigarettes. Um, that is great. Uh, they did say that they were going to include mint and menthol in that um, in that ban, which is all a good thing, and, and it's exactly what we have been asking for for a long time. Um, but as I mentioned, that announcement was on September 11th. We are now on October 23rd, and there has been no progress on that announcement at all. Um, we've heard nothing further. All they said is that it's coming in weeks. Uh, and our message is our kids can't wait. Um, that needs to happen now, and it ha needs to happen urgently, and that they must include um, mint and menthol, as they did as announced, um, because there's been a lot of pushback for them from the tobacco industry to exempt mint and menthol. Um, we sent a letter with uh, with lots of a broad spectrum of the community, um, public health, education, medical groups, uh, saying this is important and must be done. Uh, there's also, we have an open letter to the president saying, please get this done on our website, Fight Flavored E-Cigs, um, which, which we can share with uh, follow-up materials from the, um, from the webinar. 
So there's also opportunities for action in Congress. And um, the, what we believe is, is the most effective bill is, is the reversing the use of tobacco of the epidemic act of 2019. So this bill would remove flavored uh, e-cigarettes, flavored cigars, and menthol cigarettes from the market, as well as raise the age of sale to 21 and prohibit online sales of tobacco products. So, so uh, ban online sales of e-cigarettes, another way kids get these products. And we believe this is the most effective way to move forward um, and stop these products from getting into kids' hands and keep them out of kids' hands. Um, so we have been supporting this bill. We would encourage you all to, to uh, write and call your members of Congress and support this bill. It had its first hearing in the Energy and Commerce Committee last week, and we're hoping to uh, move it forward, you know, quickly. Um, another thing I mentioned is, is many states and localities have moved forward with their own bans on flavored tobacco products in, in the absence of the government uh, moving forward, which we are fully supportive of. Um, San Francisco was the first city to do this. Um, to prohibit hit at the sale. The tobacco industry then tried to overturn this with a ballot initiative, which San Francisco voters beat back um, wholeheartedly, which was fantastic to see. Uh, we've seen uh, action in New York. We believe this month they will vote on a, a bill to remove all flavored products. Um, LA County just did last uh, a couple of weeks ago. And there's a lot more that are that we believe are coming because we think um, there's a need for this and a demand for this to act and, and protect our kids. So that is, that is an overview of kind of the policy work that, that we have uh, got going, and, and we can take more questions at the end. Um, but I'll, I'll go ahead and, and uh, throw it over to Greg. Would you like to go ahead and speak about some of your um, interactions in, in your school and how you're addressing the UC cigarette epidemic? Can you, can you hear me now? Yes, we can okay, hear you. Okay, great. Hi, uh, my name is Greg Wachark. I'm the principal at Arrowhead High School in Heartland, Wisconsin, just outside of Madison, or Milwaukee, rather. And I noticed uh, this problem. We noticed as a school about two years ago, we started having students coming in uh, who were athletes and who were burning all, their, uh, all of their uh, eligibility because because they were vaping and vaping in school. And when we talked to them about it, they were, they were addicted to the nicotine in there. And then they needed that nicotine to kind of help them get through the day. And so they were vaping in class. And we tried a number of different things. We, we suspended them. We, had the, we gave them the same fine that you would get if you had, if you had cigarettes. We, uh, they, they lost athletic eligibility and co-curricular eligibility. We, uh, had a drug counselor and they had to meet with a drug counselor and still these students were were doing this and we, we came to the conclusion that these are these young these young folks are significantly addicted to the nicotine and so then what are we going to do about that when there's someone addicted and, and so um, we thought how can we handle this and, and we thought let's let's take a look and see what would be the best way to do this? And maybe if we could nip this in the bud before it got started, because once they're doing it, it's really difficult for them to get off. It's the, the addiction is so strong. So how can we be proactive and, 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 and try to handle this on the front end before they ever get started? So um, and we know this is, a, this is more than just a school issue. This is a public health issue that we have to get on top of. We have kids who are dying. We have kids who are being hospitalized. And, and kids who are, are, you know, harming their bodies that may be permanent harm that we will find out about in the down the road, and we and, and the but the attraction is so strong, the the the, the advertising, the, the the vape juices and oils that they have, the, even the little devices that they have are kind of they're kind of nice, to, they're heavy to carry, they're kind of cool, and they're you know so that kids want to, they're attracted to it. So what are we going to do about it? So. Uh, there's two things that we've done that may be a little bit different that, that, that I would like to talk about here and let you guys know how we, what we're doing. So the first thing that, that we're doing is I, I have collected uh, probably 50 devices that we have confiscated from students over the last two years. I now take that show on the road and I take those devices with a, with a lot of information, some of the stuff that Caroline shared with you earlier today, some of that data, and I go talk to parents uh, at, par at the parent 
teacher meetings. I'm a high school principal in a, it's a union high school. We have seven feeder districts that feed into us. Uh, those are all K-8 districts and I go, I've gone to those. As a matter of fact, I'm going to one tonight where I'm going and talking to the parents and I bring these devices with and I let them touch them. I let them, I let them handle them. I let them ask questions and I do a whole presentation on this is what they have. This is what they're like. This is how they use them. This is where they get them from. This is how easy they can go online and, and get it. I just go on the I go on the computer and I show how easy you can find these these uh, juices and these and these uh, vape oils, and how how easy it is to order them. And and then I go through all of that, and then I talk to them about you know, that that this is a conversation you need to have continuously with your children, not at one time and it's done. It's got to be over and over because they're being tempted over and over and over. So I wanted the idea is, is is give the parents as much information as they can get, so they understand this. So they go into conversations with their children that they would be that they have the data that they need, the information they need to be educated on this. Uh, you know, we've had so many when we'd have parent meetings after they would get caught vaping, and we'd have a parent meeting with them. We'd have so many parents that say, "Well, it's better than smoking cigarettes," and you know, at least I know that if they're doing that, then they're not doing something worse. And, and my position is, is that you don't know how, what this is going to be. You don't know how this is going to affect your child. And quite frankly, we were having these conversations before this, the, you know, before we started having children dying and before we started hospitalizing people with, with lung issues. So we were having these conversations a year and a half ago. And it's just really now that we're saying that, we're, that these parents are like clamoring. They want something. They don't know what to do. So that's the that was that's one of the things that we were doing. But we said we need to do something else, and and we didn't know kind of what to do. And and I I had a conversation with with then uh, a year ago with my 14 year old son, and uh, this is an absolute true story. I came home one day, and he was taught. Has this has nothing to do with vaping, by the way. This is has just something to do with teenage perception. So I, I came home one day from school, and he was upset because there was a schedule change. That he felt was impact, that was negatively impacting the freshmen, and I said, Grant, no, we didn't. That's not true. We didn't. There is no schedule change. It's exactly the same. And he said, No, Dad, it's not. I know it's not. And I said, Grant, I'm the one that made the schedule. I know what the schedule is. He says, Dad, I talked to two of my friends, and one's a sophomore, and they know. They understand this. They know better than you. And and I then had. A, literally go onto my computer, pull up the schedule and show it to him before he would l listen to me and believe me that, that yes, I was being truthful in how I was portraying a schedule. Well, I started thinking about that and thinking, wow, how powerful are these peers that they can in influence? My son's a bright kid. He's a, he does very well in school. And, and it's like, how can, how, how, how much influence do they have that they can convince this 14 year old boy that his dad who's the principal is wrong about the schedule that his dad created. And I started thinking about that and thinking, wow, they really, that, that's really a, a tremendous power that we have that we need to harness in some fashion. So I came up with this idea. We have these seven feeder schools. And so what we're doing now, we're in the process of doing this is I, I do a train. I, so I find, I, I, and if this is not easy to do. Uh, I find uh, three or four students from the school and I take them back to their old school. So it's not the three or four kids that I train and take them to all the schools. They're going to go back to the same exact school that they went to. And because we have seven of them, that means I got to find somewhere between 24 and 28 students to do these presentations. And when they're just once a year, so it's just a one-time presentation that they do. So we, so what I do is I, we, I take them through and give them a training on vaping and we, and I work with them, we bring them in for a couple of lunch periods. We talk about all the data. I have a PowerPoint that they use and then they use that PowerPoint to help them explain the, the negative aspects of doing, of doing the, uh, the vaping. Before we do that, what I do is I have the students, um, introduce themselves. They say, uh, what their activities were that they were involved in when they were at that school. I have them talk about what um, what activities they're in involved with here at the high school, and then finally, I have them share their fondest memory of when they were in that middle school. And and uh, when we do this, the 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 instant credibility that those students have when they talk about this teacher 
who the teacher who we made we made volca volcanoes in seventh grade and that teacher is sitting in the audience with her with her current seventh graders and the and these seventh graders look at her their teacher and look and saying here's this 17 year old senior in high school who is who is sharing uh, this this experience that I also have had and so it gives them instant credibility and then they talk about the, the all the dangers of vaping they talk about their experience um, with not vaping because that's the other part of this is and then and, and I got some kickback on this from some of my counselors but I done a little research on this I, I talked to the people at the project toward no drug abuse at USC and they they confirmed that my that that what I my my idea or the way of doing this was probably the right way to do it is to find uh, students who have never vaped who are popular who are connected who are involved in music who are involved in choir who are involved in sports who are involved in theater that the kids might know and they're the ones that then they come in and they talk about and they and and they're like positive role models and they're the ones that give the message that you should not be vaping and they give the physical reasons why they lay out the school reasons why what happens if you it, what will happen to you if you do this at school and uh, and then they talk about um, just what's going to you know what can happen to you down the road and then they share the current data the news you know how many deaths how many hospitalizations um, and then at the end of that, then we have them do questions and answers with the kids, and the kids have a ton of questions. And it and it, it really is very it's it's really cool to watch the interaction. It's very difficult because I just sit back and I don't say a word. So they, they ask really difficult questions that some of these kids don't know the answers to, but they try to they try to do it. And I and, and to not undermine their credibility, I don't say a word, even though I probably could have the answer and give it to them. But what we're finding and what the kids are saying, what we're hearing is is that they just want to hear from the kids, that the kids have more clout than sending a counselor, a police officer, a principal, a teacher in front of them to share that, to having somebody who they can connect with, who they who they look to, up to and say, hey, I remember when that kid walked these halls. I remember when that kid was the star of our seventh grade basketball team, all those things. So that's what is, and so I don't want to take out there, I don't want to uh, cut out, cut their credibility out from underneath them. So I don't, I don't jump in that. It's the kids do all of that. At the end, I say, I ask them to, to share why they've chosen not to vape. And then they give their little testimonial as to why they've chosen not to vape. And then at the end of that, after all the questions and answers, and, and we do that, I have uh, one of my counselors who stands up and then she talks to them about, and she takes maybe two minutes, three minutes, talks to them about if you have someone that's vaping, a friend, a family member, uh, a co uh, someone who's on a team with you, as a, you know, as a, a teammate, and, you, and you're worried for them, Here's what you do, and she talks to them about different steps that they can take to to do that. Um, we're we're this 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 whole thing is really costs nothing. There's no cost to the district, other than my time putting the PowerPoint together, and then all the data that I can find that I that I can you know anytime there's new data coming up, I I, I add to that PowerPoint and change it and adapt it. Um, just to give you an idea, when we did the PowerPoint two weeks ago. We did the presentation two weeks ago today. The number of deaths was at 18. And then there was a 19th death that happened the day before we gave the presentation. So it was just reported on that day. And since then, the number is now up to 33. So in two weeks, we've gone, we've, we've added 14 more deaths and about 500 more hospitalizations due to this. So those numbers, and, and, I, and I really emphasize how those numbers are growing so quickly because I think that's impactful for the students. So far, we've had we've had really great success with it. The kids seem to really respond. Um, as a matter of fact, Good Morning America is out here today, videotaping these present our presentation with the students, and then they interviewed the students, the elementary students, and I asked them because I was, I didn't sit on that conversation or the middle school students rather I didn't sit in that conversation, but he the the producer said that they verified that having those kids that was very impactful to have that type of kid who they can look up to who they they can connect with doing that so those are the two things that we've been doing that are kind of a little bit you know out of the box uh thinking and the hope is and our and, and the kids are saying you know if we can help one or two kids to not do this it's worth our effort to not to, for them not to get involved and get hooked into this this really terrible uh, addiction that can that can have you know life impacting results for them so um, so basically that's what we're doing 
And it's so far we're having some pretty good results. Thanks so much, Craig. That that's really fantastic. Um, I'll let Megan from from Truth Initiative go ahead and, and talk a little bit about um, their This Is Quitting program. I think Megan, you can go ahead and share your screen, and and then we uh, and star six to unmute, and then you'll be all set. Can everyone hear me? Yes. All right. Excellent. Uh, well, thank you so much for that amazing lead up. I've already learned so much from this call, actually. And uh, I'll breeze through some of these early slides because Caroline and Greg have already covered uh, a good bit of, of this issue, um, which is obviously really facing all of our communities right now. My name is Megan Jacobs. I'm uh, the Managing Director for Product at Truth Initiative. And that means I oversee product development for all of our cessation programs that we run, including This Is Quitting, which is our youth vaping cessation program. So as you, of course, know by now, we're in the midst of this vaping epidemic. The numbers continue to go up. Um, and we know that nicotine is particularly dangerous for teens and young adults. I just want to highlight this because it, it has the potential to really um, inflict lifelong damage on young people's brains as they're still developing. We know that, as has been mentioned, um, one jewel pod is the equivalent nicotine amount that's in a pack of cigarettes. And uh, what's even uh, scarier, I think, is that uh, research from Truth Initiative has shown that most young people do not realize uh, that all jewel products and indeed most e-cigarettes, 99% of e-cigarettes sold in gas stations and convenience stores contain nicotine. So there's really uh, you know, a feeling of young people getting hoodwinked here and uh, not realizing that they're vaping something that is so harmful. And of course, uh, as Caroline mentioned, we're, we're really concerned about e-cigarettes acting as an entry point for other tobacco products, particularly those low risk youth who, who wouldn't have otherwise likely gone, gone on to become cigarette smokers. Um, and of course, jeopardizing the, the decades of progress that we've made in the tobacco control field. So where does This Is Quitting come in? Uh, this Is Quitting is an easy to use text message program that is designed to support teens and young adults on their quit vaping journey. Young people enroll by texting Ditch Jewel to 88709 and responding to an initial age query. Users then go on to receive one age appropriate text message per day tailored to their enrollment date or their quit date, which can be set and reset by text message. Those who are not ready to quit receive at least one month of messages focused on building skills and confidence and really you know, designed to get them feeling more ready to quit. And users who do set a quit date receive messages for a week preceding it and at least 60 days afterwards that include uh, encouragement and support, skill and self-efficacy building exercises, coping strategies, and information about the risks of vaping, the benefits of quitting, and how to cut down to quit. Uh, there are a variety of keywords that provide on-demand support for cravings, withdrawal, stress, relapse, and just the demand for more messages. Uh, many of the messages are written in first person and in a conversational tone, and others have uh, actually come from other users themselves who have submitted messages to add to the program to help other vapors quit. So it's really a unique way of delivering messaging uh, that reinforces that you're not the only person quitting. Uh, other young people like you have gone through this. They have been successful. Yes, it is hard, but it is also possible. We've tailored the program in terms of how we refer to e-cigarette products. So we ask users when they first sign up which product they use, whether that's Juul or something else, and then we tailor the messages based on what product they say that they use. And uh, we also tailor our recommendations by age. So we know that teens are in school, and of course that's audience most relevant for you all here, um, but know that if you do have any young adults in your life or in your communities who you refer to this program, um, that we're not sending them messages that feel like they're uh, for high school students. We, all those boxes on the right um, contain you know, features that both program, both versions of the program have, including age appropriate guidance and recommendation and support for using nicotine replacement therapy. Those boxes on the right are essentially the strategies that we've adapted from the cigarette treatment literature. There are lots of reasons why we went with a text message approach. There is very strong evidence from the adult literature about text messaging as a treatment modality, and we know that this is how kids want to communicate. 
it can be done anonymously without their parents or teachers necessarily needing to know that they're engaged in the program. And we're able to create a flexible program that's tailored to an individual's progress in quitting that's available on demand, accessible to people in all demographic groups. It's easy to enroll and it allows users to engage even if they're not ready to set a quit date yet. We published the first report about uh, how to help young people quit, what we're seeing in terms of engagement and uptake and some signals of outcomes in uh, the journal Nicotine and Tobacco Research. And I'm gonna share some actually updated data uh, from what was published in that report with you today. So as of October 6th, we've enrolled uh, over 55,000 people. This conti number continues to climb uh, because we are enrolling between 100 and 150 young people every single day. Uh, some days it's in the thousands, depending on what's going on in the news or what's going on in popular media. Um, but you know, this is truly staggering. Uh, Teens in particular are a notoriously difficult population to reach and engage with any kind of health messaging. And so uh, we are so thrilled that so many young people have gravitated toward this program. In terms of engagement, we see that roughly 70% of users set a quit date. About 40% use those extra keywords for support around cravings, stress, relapse, and just wanting to get more messages. And 80% say that the program should be even longer. And I say even because we asked when we first launched the program if the program should be longer, shorter, or the same. And the majority of users, the British majority, said that it should be longer. So we doubled it to the length that it is now. And now when we survey users at the end, still 80% say that the program should be even longer. So we're going to keep examining that and finding ways you know, to meet all of our users and, and what they want out of the program. In terms of impact, we're really encouraged by what we're seeing so far. At two weeks, we see that over 60% of users report that they vape less or not at all anymore. And I have Juul in this slide because the majority of users are using Juul, um, but we ask the question differently if, uh, if a user says that they use it. In terms of longer term abstinence, we see that a little over a quarter of our users have seven day abstinence at three months, meaning that at three months from enrolling, uh, they report that they haven't vaped at all in the past seven days. And 16% of users report that they haven't vaped at all in the past 30 days when we ask them at three months. So really, really encouraging, uh, very consistent with what we see in other evidence-based tobacco treatment. Um, and we are continuing to evaluate this program on an ongoing basis to make sure that we're you know, consistently being effective and doing what we can to optimize that effectiveness. In terms of partnership options, we hear from a lot of schools and school districts, um, how can we bring this program to our young people? And that's amazing. And we really want to support you doing that. So we offer a number of different ways to partner with us to either customize the program for your particular school or district, to co-brand the program, to receive reporting about how your population is using it, and uh, to get support for rolling out this program in your school. We also offer free promotional materials, and I should have put the um, email address on here, and I apologize for that oversight, um, but hopefully this is, I think, being recorded, and all of you who are listening in real time maybe can write this down. You can email help at thisisquitting.com to receive free promotional materials from Truth Initiative, uh, digital promotional materials that you can print out and make available to your students either as flyers or as palm cards and we roll out new materials on a pretty ongoing basis so we refresh those for you uh, throughout the year and uh, we're thrilled to partner with you on any level financially uh, that is comfortable for you whether you want to pursue um, paid partnership options that I have on the board here or if you want to receive those free promotional materials we love, love, love to support schools um, rolling this out. And as Greg mentioned, I cannot support enough um, how much we endorse a peer-to-peer -peer approach. Uh, we, we know that young people love to hear information from other peers of theirs. And so to the extent that you can promote This Is Quitting through a peer-to-peer -peer approach, we always support that too. So thank you so much uh, for giving me the opportunity to share with you today. Um, I am happy to answer questions if folks have them. 
Uh, I don't know, Caroline, what your, what your format is here, but that's it for me in terms of presenting. Yeah, Megan, there's one uh, question in the, in the text box. Is this is quitting available to students who have an international mobile phone number? Uh, that is a great question. It is not available internationally. This program is only available in the U.S. And then and I am putting the email address in that chat box right now. Right. Help That's, at yeah. thisisquitting.com. Yep, great question. And then, yeah, if there's any other questions about any of the, thank you so much, Megan. That was, that was sure. fantastic. Um, My pleasure. If there's any other questions, we're, we're happy to take them. Um, but as well as, as Megan said, we are recording this to, to share with folks who, who registered but, but couldn't sign up. We know uh, your all schedules are, are uh, tough to get around and for folks that can watch it afterwards, um, please also feel free to email me, Caroline, at Tobacco Free Kids. Um, my name is on the registration if you have any follow-up questions of, of how we can help. Um, if you want to call and right, speak right now, you can do star six to unmute, um, but also uh, just just feel free to email too. Okay, if there's no questions, we can, we can go ahead and end. Thank you all so much for, for your time today. We really appreciate it and, and all your assistance and everything you're doing every day to, to help kids in schools. Um, and however we can help you combat the youth e-cigarette epidemic, we, we wanna do that. Um, so, so please let us know. And, and thank you to Megan and Greg so much for, for speaking today. Um, thanks, all. All right. Bye-bye.